Welcome back to the C-Mask podcast, everybody. We have Mike, Tim, and Will joining me. And we're going to revisit today one of our most explosive and life-altering podcasts, uh, the Dump Her episode. And today we're going to be going through the Dump Him list. Um, Dump Her really shook things up uh, when Tim and Steph did it on their show. Um, and then we came back and did a, an extravaganza on C-Mask. It was two and a half hours long. Uh, we had AJ Barker and Royce White on. Really fun show. And there was a lot of fallout from that. Most people have no senses of humor. Most people have no discernment capacity. And all of the normies got really upset, um, unfortunately, also with our friends who were on the show there. Um, and then recently, I, I went on with Tim and Steph, and we did a show uh, about a few things. And, and one of the main topics was Lauren Southern and her criticizing, quote unquote, traditional marriage uh, as a scapegoat for her poor discernment, her poor decision making choices in a mate. And so today, what I'd like us to do is help the ladies out. I want to help the ladies out with uh, a list of things, not, you know, the obvious stuff. Oh, he watches porn or like he beats small animals in his free time or something like that, but very legitimate things that they can do so that they feel empowered to submit. This is what we're calling them to do. We're calling women to submit. And so they should feel um, fulfilled and happy to do so. And so in order to do that, they should go through a, a very basic vetting process of these guys. And I don't really think there's a lot of information out there for women to do, at least not good, not coming from from guys like us, from uh, an intellectual tradition such as ours. So we're going to go through a list here. And uh, Will, let's, let's start with you on your list of dump him. What should a woman uh, vet for first? So I don't know what points you guys are going to make. So there might be some overlap here. And, you know, the first thing I thought of was if he wants sex before marriage. And I was thinking that should go about saying. Like if he's, if he's doing something that's contrary to what the Catholic Church teaches and you're Catholic, why would you want anything to do with this guy? So I'm going to take that as a given, but we can go into it in more detail later if we want to. Then I was thinking, what do women actually have built into them as the main things that they look for when it comes to a long-term mate, to a spouse. And there's four big things that come up in the literature on this from scientific research. And I wanted to pick one of them. The four of these, they want a man with status, resources, ambition, and a man who shows commitment. So I'm going to pick one of those and it's going to be status. And what is status basically? Well, it's to do with a man's reputation. You need to get social proof of his value. And mostly that's going to come from other men. So look at how other men treat him. If he's someone who adds value to his relationships, a guy that other guys want to have around because he's dependable, he's useful, he can help them solve problems, he's good to network with, then that's going to be a pretty good indicator to you that you can depend on him as well. And he's going to add value to you in your life. If other guys don't want him around, there's probably a good reason for that. They've learned the hard way that this is a guy who, more often than not, he might take value, right? There's a cost to having him around. He ruins things. And how have they learned that? Because this guy has shown time and time again that he lacks prudence. Like he can't learn from his experience the right way to act. He hasn't developed the skills that he needs to be able to become valuable socially. So I would look at how other men in his life treat him. Does he seem like he is respected? If not, if you can't see he's got friends who want him around, that should be a red flag. And what what I'm when I, you sent that, I was thinking, what's the difference between that and um, popular? Like, I, I don't want women to think about this in like the sort of high school sense. Mm. And then also, what's the difference between that and 
maybe not the difference, but like, what's the upper limit of that in terms of a woman who expects him to be like Wall Street playboy with all kinds of rich friends and taking her out to fancy dinners and stuff? Right. Well, a lot of that comes down to how do you define status? And money is likely to be part of it. If we're beyond high school age, status generally gets rewarded with money or salary because that's about an exchange of value and someone who brings a lot of value to an organization is going to be paid for it. So that will come into it, but I don't think that that is the sole way of measuring status. So there might be guys who are extremely highly paid, but they don't really have the kind of social proof associated with that that you want because of the social circles they're moving in. So if you look at the idea that birds of a feather flock together, yeah, look at the friends as well. Look at him, what kind of status does he have, but then go out beyond that to the social circle. Uh, what is it that they are valuing him for? Even in some of the bad things, like just the ability to earn lots of money or maybe be uh, manipulative or Machiavellian in the business world, there's probably something good underlying that, like some level of intelligence or social skills that he could turn to better ends. So be cautious, but you've got to think about who is doing the valuing as well. That's how I'd make that distinction, Nick. Yeah, I I think it's tough because a lot of guys when they're starting out, like they're there may be a decade away from any kind of meaningful status or salary. You know, they're just getting started mm. you know we just one of our early marriages in or i should say engagements in the matchmaking uh he's 20 he's just out of college so whatever he's thinking about doing it's going to take between four and ten years before that like even if he got some crazy masters in finance or whatever it is and that and he's making 300k a year suddenly um so is there some other kind of metric for status that would also attract or justify a woman's discernment then? Because I don't want women to walk away from this and go, okay, so we were right. Six pack, six figures, six feet tall. <laughs> so if she's looking at him when he's that young, 18, 19, 20, 21, hasn't really had the chance to achieve much financially yet then that's fine because like we're saying, salary won't be the only measure of status. Start with some of the basic stuff that I mentioned earlier. Do his friends actually trust him like in positions of responsibility? Are they someone, is he someone they look to for input, opinion on different subjects? Is he a leader in his friendship group in some yeah. sense? Like if he is probably a good indication that he'll be able to lead you as well. If not, yeah, I think that's, then that's, that's, I think the main thing to look for is he doesn't necessarily have to be on top of his group, but he should be in the, the upper echelon of guys because guy, guy friendship groups, whether, you know, four guys or seven or eight guys or more, they're always um, taxonomically clear and, and like hierarchically clear. And you want, you don't necessarily need the like head guy, but one of one of the top guys that's considered one of the most competent guys. You don't want one of the um, flunkies. Usually a guy friend group does have flunkies. And I think that's the level of status that really tracks. You know, it's a great it's a great opening element that Will offers here. And I think you don't want the guy that's maybe the fourth or fifth guy in a group of eight that might be the token high earner guy who's not a leader. You want, you know, the first or second guy because it it, it tends to be um, a holistic, comprehensive spectrum that, that um, guy friend groups are based on. So he'll probably earn a fair amount when he gets older or whatever. And he he's moral, and he he ha he knows how to deal with people. Um, if he's one of one or two of those guys, so I think status is a great one, particularly in the context of look how his friends regard him. Yeah, the cool thing about it is that um, men always exist in dominance hierarchies socially. Even yeah. age two, three, toddlers figure it out. There's a pecking order, and the way the dominance hierarchy works is that they they compete with each other according to 
criteria that are ultimately rooted in what women reward. Like men compete with each other for status as a proxy for the ability to like provide resources and signal to women that they can do that. So when a woman's looking at where he is in the dominance hierarchy, it's basically how good is he going to be at leading you and providing for you? So it's a shortcut way to getting straight to that. Yeah, <clears throat> Mike, when I when I hear this, I think that um, status is a, it's actually an indicator of leadership capacity because you can't achieve status really without at least some sub virtue that pr provides leadership. Have you found this to be the case for, for your, the guys that you end up coaching if where they fall in that, um, the dominance hierarchy that Will's talking about, do you notice the corollary between if they have any status and if they have any virtues that tend toward leadership? Yeah, I mean, you can see it. I mean, it's most often and most clear with guys that are successful in the business realm are going to have, they're going to possess some of these these virtues and traits by nature of being successful men. Same thing with guys that have a degree of physical competency as well, guys that are well-versed. A lot of my friends back home are either current or ex-pro mixed martial artists. So there's that physical prowess that, yeah, that has a status that is associated with that, that comes with that and a frame that comes with that. Same thing with, I'm sure Will's seen it too, guys in the gym. I mean, there's definitely a hierarchy and a pecking order in the gym too. But even outside of that, uh, I think status also pertains to how the guy shows up physically. So he doesn't got to be Joe six pack, but if he's slovenly overweight, you know, doesn't really take care of himself. is not dressed well. Doesn't like to present himself particularly well. Yeah. I would say that's definitely uh, a red flag as well. I think there's got to be a degree of not just, you know, spiritual fortitude, but I think if there is a degree of spiritual fortitude, I think naturally uh, physical fortitude starts to present itself as well that I think those things are more linked than I think we give it, we give it credit. Um, but most definitely. And the guys that flounder in the leadership of their marriages. Yeah. You, sometimes you get those guys that are really high earners that are kind of effeminate and just know how to be just this really highly competent and have status in this one specific area. Most commonly though, I see guys that are you know, making decent amounts of money, but in all aspects of their life, they're invisible and they're kind of like average frustrated chumps. AFCs. <laughs> okay, so number one on the dump him list. Uh, if he has no discernible status in any hierarchy, in his friends, in his career, in his community, probably going to want to dump him. So for the second one, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here, and I'll I'm gonna cut in the scene that I'm referring to, but I will read to you guys the scene. Um. And it's from my all-time favorite movie, Meet Joe Black. Mm -hmm. It's so ridiculous. Do you love Joe? Do that now. Do it later. No, don't do anything. Just, just stay exactly. Do you love Drew? You mean like you loved Mom? Forget about me, Mom. Are you going to marry him? Probably. Listen, I'm crazy about the guy. He's smart, he's aggressive, he could carry parish communications into the 21st century and be along with it. Mm -hmm. So what's wrong with that? That's for me. I'm talking about you. It's not what you say about you, it's what you don't say. Maybe you're not listening. Oh, yes, I am. There's not an ounce of excitement, not a whisper of a thrill. And this relationship is all the passion of a pair of titmice. I want you to get swept away. I want you to levitate. I want you to sing with rapture and dance like a dervish. Oh, that's all? Yeah, be deliriously happy, or at least leave yourself open to me. Okay. Be deliriously happy. I shall, uh, I shall do my utmost. <laughs> I know it's a cornball thing, but love is passion, obsession, someone you can't live without. Hmm. I say, fall head over heels. Find someone you can love like crazy and who'll love you the same way back. 
How did you find him? Well, you forget your head and you listen to your heart. I'm not hearing any heart. Because the truth is, honey, there's no sense living your life without this. To make the journey and not fall deeply in love. Well, you haven't lived a life at all. But you have to try. Because if you haven't tried, you haven't lived. Bravo. Oh, you're tough. <sighs> I'm sorry. Okay. Give it to me again, but the short version this time. Okay. Stay open. Who knows? Lightning could strike. Then the film introduces another character played by Brad Pitt, and uh, she realizes what her dad was talking about. She feels that that lightning strike, and so for for my first offering on dump him is if it's just right if it's just correct on paper it's just correct but you're not living in a world where i couldn't live without this person they're not your best friend dump them and that might take some time it might take a couple of months to to know if that's the case but if you've been dating six nine twelve months and you're responding in a very dry he's you know he's correct for me he has x y and you start like describing like on paper resume sort of characteristics as opposed to um chemistry i think i think you should probably dump them tim you yeah that's a great point about oh go ahead mike no i was just gonna say uh, but i think we should probably maybe uh I mean, parse that one a little bit more because the fear there that I have or the worry that I have is uh, these women that are very impressionable and gullible, um, particularly the more virtuous ones that are not ex exposed to the world, let's say, um, will take that as falling for the quote unquote bad guy because that lightning strike quite often happens with those bad guys quote unquote. I know that because I was one of those bad guys. Right. And so there is a, like an electricity that you can sort of like inject into a woman just by showing up as that kind of guy. And I just want to, you know, I just want, I, I think not to be careful. We don't, you know, you know what I'm trying to say as a, I'm speaking as a man with just like these two guys with daughters. And I'm like, ah, how would we explain it to them? Mm. okay well i don't have daughters tim what do you you're not in about what mike said and what i said so what what are you thinking i'd, I'd say I, I mean i agree I, I like i like it as a number two but it's more problematic for men to settle for for women women, women pretty much i don't know i mean the, it kind of contradicts the point of the show but they pretty much always want to settle down with any decent guy they're with and it's it's concomitant with their nature because they can't just go find someone better so i would say if you told this to men it's correct you should be passionate about the person that you find and it should be someone you you feel like you can't live without but that will make them a little bit paranoid um that that can make them scrupulous like well i really love this girl is, is that enough and, and so it's a tough metric with women i think it's it's true to tell it to them too um which is why it's a good number two but um yeah i don't know if they know exactly what they look that looks like because women aren't by their natures passionate the way men are so i think it's it's um i don't know i i want to see the scene but it sounds like male screenwriting for women because um mm -hmm. it, it's it's advice you give to young men and remember women are pretty any guy that they're that's halfway decent that's asked them out we have to transpose they're pretty much like ready to settle down with any half decent guy and i'm not saying that that's the best thing but it's not a bad thing and it is part of female nature because they are receptive and they're passive so certainly if they're with a guy that that they find boring but acknowledge on like openly boring but they acknowledge <laughs> on paper is good then yeah dump him and i think that's that's what you're saying i'm just saying some guys take this to heart and um um this this point that you need to be passionate about your spouse 
And so they're like seeking all the ends of the earth and and perhaps some guys will will dump someone that they shouldn't be dumping because of it. Um so I don't know, that's what that's what I have to offer. It's a it's a good point though. It belongs on this list. Romeo and Juliet is about the dangers of this kind of passion. So he gives her all the right kind of tingles, but that doesn't mean it's ever going to work out. And right from the beginning of the play, Shakespeare describes it as a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life whose misadventured piteous overthrows do with their death bury their parents' strife. So the idea that it was star-crossed and misadventured right from the beginning, despite this earth-shaking passion that they share, that should give everyone pause. It's Mike's point. Just because he makes you tingle doesn't mean he's going to be the one who can actually sustain the commitment across the whole lifelong marriage. So I think some measure of excitement is important, but excitement itself, by itself, that's not sufficient. You can't build a relationship on that alone because there are guys who have made it their thing to be able to manipulate you in the moment. Say just the right thing, move the right way, and then it'll drop your guard, and then that'll be dangerous. If you spent any length of time being a promiscuous degenerate like I was, which I highly recommend men don't because there's nothing there for you, only hell waits for you, um, you know and learn very well how to manufacture the lightning strike. And you can play to that susceptibility. And so one of the things that I'm going to be teaching my daughters is actually beware of the lightning strike because a lot of these guys know how to do it. Sometimes it's just a byproduct of being a certain kind of guy, but a lot of these guys know, and they're very deliberate about it. Now, what I'll say is I completely agree that if it's just Mr. Safe on paper and there's not even some semblance of any kind of romance or reaction, then yeah, that definitely belongs belongs on that list. And on the flip side, I was on the dumper thing, but one real point that I, I keep colliding with with a lot of guys that I, that, 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 that um, do coaching with me is that they let really good women and they complain about being single, let's just say, let's say 30 plus, whatever. They let really good women pass them by because they're not 10 out of 10s or they're not maximally sexually attracted to them. And I think it's retarded. And those guys need to really like reevaluate why they're single in their 30s. And I'm not singling anybody out because I had a call this morning. I'm not singling this guy out or anybody out, but it's, it's a fact of reality. I think we need to probably speak to that more. But anyways, back to the topic. Sorry. No, that's that's good. We probably should have defined our boundaries of who, who, what kind of woman we're talking to here. Like this isn't a 35 year old. This is not a 35 year old non virgin woman uh, who like has um, is a paralegal and wears pantsuits and is really like pounding the pavement hard. Um, we're talking 18 to 24, 25, you know, maybe 27, 28, but really like the type of women who we accept into our matchmaking program, 18 to 25 who are practicing Catholics who they're, they're pleading in DMS with, with Will, with Tim, with Mike, uh, nobody DMs me about this, thankfully, um, or going to the return matchmaking service. And they're, they're like, I just want a good guy. It's like, all right, well, we're about to tell you what, like a, a good guy is, or well, at least what they they are not. Um, but I'm glad you clarified, Mike, with with the word safe. That's the dichotomy that I was trying to explain. N- not danger. I'm not advocating for danger. I'm saying the difference between safe, like S&P 500, 5% return on your money over the course of 25 years type safe versus like you're like checking your watch. When can I go see this person again? And if you're not doing that, if like if you can go long periods of time and not think about them, not want to text them, kind of prefer to hang out with your friends as opposed to with that person. I'm talking best friend energy here. That's that's what I meant. And I thought that scene did a really good job. And what's what I love about the scene is it is coming from a father to a daughter. He understands it because he's he tells his daughter, he's like, This is what I had with your mother. And she's sort of more cynical about it. Like, well, that's easy for you to say, like, and then, and, and sort of defends like Drew's a good guy. He's a good guy. I'm going to marry him and things are going to be good. And 
he just wants his daughter to have that same kind of um, joy that he had with his wife. Um, and it's so it's a it's a wonderful film. Highly recommend everybody watches that. Um, but coming from three fathers, I think it's you know all all three very fair uh, responses to what I to what I had to say there. Um, moving on, Tim. What do you got for us? What what should a woman dump a guy over? Mama's boy. You, you don't want a mama's boy. Mm. And uh, it's a guy that that um, listens to his mom. And yeah, I mean, you want a guy that's his own man. So you don't want a guy that implicitly I'm talking a grown grown up who implicitly will do whatever his dad says. You want a guy that can stand on his own two feet. But if he's going to be listening to one of his parents, it ought to be his father his mother, he ought to love and, and treat well, but you don't want a guy that listens to his mom. That's a mama's boy. And there's going to be leadership problems in the marriage without a doubt. If you're, if you're dealing with one of them, so definitely a, a, a dump him list. And by the way, yeah, we, we're not trying to, we're not, we know that nobody's going to get mad at, at a, at a dump him episode because the world is kind of centric. So it's, it's kind of funny to, to, to flip it because it, it, it's not the same thing. And dump her was lightning in a bottle because you can't ever say anything bad about women or you, you can never advocate for dumping women. Um, that's why it's fun to do. There'll be a couple of guys mad because Mike's saying they don't oh, deserve sure. 10 out of 10s. Like that stings when you tell guys, no, the women you like don't like you back because they're all too attractive for you. Like that hurts yeah. people's feelings, but it needs to be said. So th it's true, Tim, what you say, but there'll still be some some rage and some seething. Yeah, it's probably going to be guys who are not in any sort of physical condition who take the faith really, really seriously and think that um, we talked about on uh, whatever show when we, we discussed prayer, how much prayer a guy should do that like that piety doesn't purchase you like any social capital with it might purchase you a little bit, but it's not, you're not interesting. You're not attractive. You're not romantic. Uh, so those are probably going to be the guys who heard what Mike just said and get very upset. Yeah. And if humility is the road to heaven and marriage is your vocation, <clears throat> do you really think it's not going to start by humbling you? <laughs> of course it will. Like at the beginning, humble yourself yeah the yeah, problem is that we live in a coomer culture most of these guys are just straight up coomers or recovering coomers so they have this really weird coomer lens that they look at dating through and they're like five foot two 155 pounds skinny fat built like et and they think they deserve a nine out of ten like who like what what drugs are you sm smoking or sniffing my friend now these, these these guys need to hear this hard truth there's going to be more guys seething than we can possibly imagine this is the this is the world we live in this is why our yeah. work is so important just none of us are going to well we don't have jobs but I mean, we, have profession. <laughs> we have professions but we don't have like bosses uh but nobody who like shares this one is going to get fired for sharing it i think is is the point no. that, that tim was making is that like I'm not it's saying not, anyone's been fired. I'm just saying people people have been in trouble sufficient to be fired. Um, lots, lots, and lots yeah. of people uh, that shared this. So, yeah, and the pur the purpose of this show isn't because I think you know there's no sort of inflammatory value. I genuinely think we this could be a service uh, to um, uh, Martine, um, the kind woman that you sent me her Instagram page will um, is going to be posting about her matchmaking. And one of the, the things that she's writing in her caption is that like, it's very traditional to have guy like patriarchs in your community, help you find a husband. And that's gone. It's gone. Is that and, Martine de Luna? Yeah. Yeah. She's a nice woman. She's very kind. And, and, you know, in an effort to facilitate more, um, young women being aware of our service here as opposed to just young guys who we speak to all the time reached out to her and and in in this caption she's explaining the traditional role of patriarchs helping young women to find a good quality man and she acknowledges in this caption that like that's kind of absent now like most women don't have fathers who are present or even if they're present they have no clue i mean they're boomer dads who 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 
will miss every point that we're making right now, or they're going to have some annoying caveat for why what we just said was not something that they should follow. So this is for them um, coming from, from four guys who have, you know, a lot of insight on that. So, but Will, you said mama's boy is Tim was, Tim was right about that. What, uh, what about it? Did you find accurate? I just want to slip in quickly. Another point is, if he's afraid to get fired because of speaking the truth, like, <laughs> that's another one. I've been fired. Yeah. I'm fine. I'm having a great time. I'm here hanging out with all you guys living my life, <laughs> still supporting my family. Like, it's okay. Don't be afraid. It's more important for you to just say what the truth is and then accept the consequences. So that's a, a small sub point. But yeah, Mama's Boy, the problem with that is that he's not going to lead in your marriage. She is. Yeah. his mom will lead your marriage because he's never actually learned to be his own man in the way that Tim said. And a lot of the guys that I work with, they do not understand what it means to put their wives above their own mothers. They have weak boundaries around their family and they fail as protectors. And that relationship between the wife and the mother-in-law it's so intense that it's even the subject matter for many of the world's fairy tales. Like it's archetypally troublesome and you don't want to play around with that. Uh, a guy who can't stand up to his own mother is not going to be able to stand up to you probably when you need it. He won't be able to stand up to other men. He just can't stand up to the world generally. He's a man with weak boundaries. I heard something once, uh, this is a metaphor, incoming metaphor. I'm not advocating for matricide, but it was some sort of Petersonian phrase. I don't think he actually said it, but you have to kill your mother and rescue your father. Every young man has to kill his mother and rescue his father. This is allegorical, obviously. Like the opposite of Oedipus. Exactly. Exactly. Or Stein. This is the Oristian. Orestes. So. I, I thought thought someone would pick up on that but yeah i mean literally literally orestes um son to a slain father killed by you know son to agamemnon and clytemnestra uh, i thought everyone would just jump in i guess this is my greek mythology nerdiness uh i'm like forced <laughs> i all right everyone's like <laughs> yeah yeah tim's, tim's just timing yeah. so hard right now <laughs> yeah yeah i'm like right come on let's fucking go um the Orestes, or Orestes is agamemnon's son when agamemnon returns home from from the come on you know this story audience uh, he returns home Say it with me from from being gone for 10 years or whatever a little a little quicker than than odysseus uh clytemnestra has taken a lover and killed him and that's how agamemnon dies it's he was killed by a woman so he wasn't a mensch at all it turns out and she was mad that uh, Agamemnon had uh, sacrificed his daughter Iphigenia, I think. And um, and so literally the definition of tragedy, a lot of people don't know. They'll say it's tragic when something sort of sad happens. That's not what it is. It, it's for a character. I'm just basing this off of the late, great Walter Kaufman. Um, it's when you're, a character is caught between the natural law and the positive law. That's that's what a tragedy is. So um, Orestes, son to a killed daughter and a slain father, um, now is required by the natural law to avenge his father against his mother, Clytemnestra. Um, yet the positive law will condemn him for it. So it's it qualifies for Kaufman's definition of a tragedy. Anyway, I that's yeah. No one no one has read it. I guess here so. <laughs> And him can't help you this guy <laughs> and also just to piggyback off that point none of what tim said i even really understood as <laughs> per usual so I, <laughs> I appreciate it i'll uh, i'll have to check it out and learn greek or whatever language you just spoke there tim <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, translated into english mike <laughs> yeah yeah your version of english whatever english you speak <laughs> There are three surviving uh, Greek tragedians. That's all I'm saying. This is this is uh, Aeschylus and uh, the one one of one of the three greats. You might want to check them out. That's all I'm saying, people. <laughs> if you're making a recommendation, it's yeah, 
I'll have to take heed. You'll just have to probably walk me through it like grade five level. But the mom, the mommy's boy thing is um, not only will she potentially come between, but it's also you're going to the, the woman's going to turn into the mommy of the relationship. So either one or both are going to be true. Either it's going to be his mom leading your relationship or your mom or not your mom, you leading your relationship. So, I mean, both are equally horrific and i've seen it i'm a i'm an italian guy dude we love and cherish our mothers um but all, almost too much and i've seen the effects of that in in yeah. directly in my own family it's it's uh few things are worse let's just put it that way well do you want to keep going mike and and tell us what uh one of your dump him qualifications are? yeah uh i think a big one i mean other than the obvious of if he wants to have sex with you before marriage, dump him. I mean, we don't really have to explain why. I mean, I think we know that's one of the probably the greater lit litmus tests of a man that's, you know, really serious. Um, don't give him that. You actually had a woman on a Twitter spaces I was just doing with Evan Amato, uh, Re Rewire the West, right before I hopped on here. And a woman was like, well, how do I, I come kind of from like a feministy household. How do I distinguish like the men from the boys? Well, the boys are going to want to think with their pee pee. And they're going to want you to touch their pee pee. And on the other hand, the men have some self control and some restraint and they honor God enough and, and honor you enough to save that for the sacrament of matrimony. So like, that's got to be at the top of the list, at least top three. Um, uh, the other point, a universally unattractive trait, um, is, uh, stinginess. If he's cheap with money. Is he, if he's, if he's a miser, uh, probably dump him. Um, I've seen few guys bounce back from that that mm. where it didn't require much prayer much like forced generosity um and the reason i say this is because i was kind of one of those guys right where i always made good money great money praise god but i had sort of a scarcity mindset around money and that is a very unattractive trait generosity is a universally attractive trait there's a there's a sort of a signal of abundance there and trust in god's providence but if he's overly stingy miserly he's probably going to want to split the, split the bills with you it's probably going to be a bit more of a feministy household he's probably going to want you to work um he cannot lead you if all of those things are true I'd be curious to hear your guys thoughts on that it's a great point but yeah i think fear is at the root of it like if he spends it, will he ever be able to earn it back? It's a lack of confidence and lack of trust in God. You don't want someone who just spends way more than he earns. That will be a problem too. And that can end up wrecking your household as well. But yeah, if he wants to split the bills the whole time and put financial pressure on you, he doesn't really want patriarchy. He just wants someone to make his own life easier. Right. And that means he kind of still wants mommy. Yep. Yeah. In the ethics I'll, I'll I'll just uh, give this nod to what Mike and Will both said. The virtue is liberality. Someone that that spends money um, as he should, which is you know um, willingness to share on others is a significant portion of that. It's been rooted out of this wasp Anglo American Canadio culture, um, and the the vice of excess. Too much of that is um, profligacy to be a profligate spender. The vice of deficiency is um, niggardliness, which is, um, that's right. Yeah, Aristotle had a rap career too. Um, so it's, it's remember that virtue is a golden mean between two vices, and yet it's a geometric mean. So it's clo every virtue is closer to one of the vices than the other. It's never a midpoint. Liberality is closer to... Uh, profligacy slightly than to niggardliness because the worst thing you can be in one of the most irremediable of all the vices when aristotle compares vices to each other is someone that's that's mean that's uh, mean with his money niggardly uh, spendthrift so i can't not giggle every time i say that but um y you want to yeah you want a guy i absolutely agree with will's psych assessment a guy that's not afraid you know make if you make it spend it and why not why not spend it largely on others that's a that's the manly thing to do and a little bit on yourself too and so of course you got to save but guys that um just try to save it's, it's based on fear they're anal retented they've never read what is it luke's gospel parable of the rich fool they think they can um you know um buy security uh stave off the storm crows you can't so don't be scared, guys. Once you make the money, be willing to spend some of it.
I think you guys are actually, Mike, you're, you struck yeah. on a type of guy that I do think is attractive to women, which is sort of that rock star um, drifter a little bit, but, but there's a, a very specific characteristic. So if a guy is miserly, it could either be fear because he doesn't know that he doesn't have the confidence in, in himself that he can make that money. He doesn't have the skill set. It can also be laziness because he doesn't want to have to work to make that money back. So like, we're just going to eat very poorly. We're going, we're not going to go out. We're not going to go watch a movie. We're not going to go have experiences. You're not going to go to the apple orchard. You're not going to go buy new clothes or anything like that because I worked so hard for this money and I don't want to spend it on frivolity or, or whatnot. And so, but is the apple orchard more expensive than I was thinking? <laughs> it's just, what, it's just sort of quintessential fall, fall cuffing activity sort of situation. Um, Misers dislike apple orchards though. Specifically. They hate, they hate. They hate yeah. I'm like, are they expensive? The, I, the, the local thinking, apple San, Sandy Run, like, we just, cheap. we just did that. We just like went to, pumpkin pick or whatever so that was on my brain i was like you wouldn't do like you live in canada it's all expensive trust me so uh yeah it could be from from that sort of the effeminacy the curse of adam i just don't want to put in the work to go make more money in the first place i think it's worth um expanding just briefly on will's very very first point and what mike just said about no sex before marriage the bar is actually a lot higher and if you're going so far but then saying okay well we didn't have sex before marriage it's yeah you're you sh she'll get pregnant that you don't you don't toy with that for a long time and um you know it's not even just near occasion of sin it's sin to get to go that far if we're if we're talking like the base system uh for a second third fourth base if you're like well we only ever went to third base like you're you're retarded. Stop that. So if a guy is just trying to push the envelope and making you be the person who upholds the chastity boundaries, like I, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't even maybe go with the specifics of it. Just if it's, if the man puts it on the woman to be the arbiter of the boundary of chastity, dump him. That's bullshit. Yeah. That's not a man. Agreed. Not a man. By the way, Nick, it's, it's not fourth base. It's home base. Just no, no, a sports no. factor. I have, I have uh, a very large. It's a baseball square. I have a baseball. Uh, you convinced Pentagon. me, Nick. So you convinced me. <laughs> I'm from Canada. <laughs> Wait, Nick's it's Nick's not, an anti sports. There's guy. not a. But like he's not stealing fourth. fourth. <laughs> <laughs> True. All right. Fair. Just, just so we don't lose our bona fides here. Yes. Okay. Next on the list. Let's go back to you, Will. What do you got? Well, I had four at the beginning that run to cover. Oh, you, you said, okay. Yeah, but we kind of Did talked. Did you say all of them? You, you No, no, I status. didn't. I picked out one big one. You status. picked one, though. Yeah. yeah. The other one, ambition, right? I know we've, talking, we've spoken about ambition as a bad thing sometimes, and it, it very often can be if it's just about vain glory and a man looking to glorify himself. But if it's a guy who doesn't actually want to fulfill his full potential to glorify God and make an impact on the world and add value to everyone else in his life, then I think that can be a bad thing. So someone who's not actually going to make the most of his skills and the opportunities that come his way. Why is that bad? Because he'll lack a deeper sense of purpose in his life. And that kind of guy will tend to simp for a woman, which is a very dangerous position for a woman to be put in. He'll make her the center of his life. Hmm. And that puts too much weight on you as a woman. You shouldn't be there. That's disordered. So if he doesn't actually have that drive about him, the focus, the motivation to go after something that stretches him to his full potential, then especially if it comes alongside some of these other things we're talking about, red flag as well. Yeah, I think there's, so I'm curious what you guys think about this. In the same way that there's the um, Coomer mindset guy who has this perfect woman in his mind as a result of a hypersexualized habit. And he's not going to settle for anything less than 
that ideal supermodel porn star whatever that he's built up in his head plus also she's a catholic plus also she's a virgin plus also she's submissive like all of these things just bottled together um i wonder if there's sort of something similar that thanks to the red pill thanks to social media um that women have in their mind as well that and this isn't an invalidation of your point well i think it's just the uh, the right hand bound so the left hand bound is he should have some kind of ambition some kind of drive to pursue things but also i wonder if women can have sort of this if he's not earning x number of dollars or like rising up in some sort of company that um that it's he's unworthy and i I want to make room for the electricians and the school teachers and the writers and the whoever's um, electricians yeah. can make bank, bro bank. Yeah. But it's not like status, you know, it's not, and you wouldn't call like a guy, even a guy who's like, I'm, and then I'm going to start my own electrical company and then I'm going to hire other guys. And like, we're going to have like, even that's, I should, I would say sufficient ambition as long as he's like pursuing something with sincerity, but like, where do you find that the left and the right hand bound on that? I think ultimately a woman should be satisfied with a man that can cover everything and then also be there to raise, help raise the children when he's done work and to be there for her and lead spiritually. I think, I don't think it's necessarily, obviously, you know, as things get more expensive, it's somewhat tied to like a certain dollar amount per year. But I think if he desires that and can do that, I think a woman should restrain her appetite and bring it to that level where she's ultimately going to be, she's going to be no happier if he makes half a million versus 50 K a year. Um, if the household dynamic is straight, I don't know if you guys disagree with that, but no, I think that's a good point. I would just reject the framing of Nick's question totally, which is you assumed as a well, default okay, that then. Am, amb <laughs> ambition um, is going to be mainly financial. I think Mike's response, like his ambition could just be, I'm going to be the best dad I can be. I'm really going to push it on that dimension of my life. I'm not going to be content with not really finding out what my weaknesses are, working on them and trying to bring everything to this role. Because I feel like this is deeply important to me. If it's a guy who's just wants to be like, yeah, whatever, I'm, we got a kid now, I'm going to carry on watching the game. Like there's no real ambition there. There's no passion about what you're doing in life. And sure, the money's going to be important. And that's a good point, Nick, about women who are expecting you know, six th figures or nothing. I'm not interested. Uh, there is a kind of delusion there. And pride is also the reason, just like men, um, most women who are unhappily single are single. It comes down to pride too. It's just right. what human nature is. So it's a great point you bring up. I would just reject the idea that the main measure of ambition is how he brings money into the home. No, and that was that was the point that I was trying to make is that if if he is a school teacher, if he is an author, if he is an electrician or a plumber or whatever, and it's not clearing six figures, what does ambition look like? That's that's what I was trying to parse out is that mm. there is there is some other expression of drive in a man that isn't his career. In fact, we just said this at the end of the show I did with Tim and Steph. Careers are gay. Careers are so gay. Stop with the like rising the corporate ladder type nonsense. There's um, that's not, in my opinion, how a man demonstrates drive. It can be, but that's not the default. That is yeah. not the form of a way in which a man demonstrates ambition or drive. It is gay. Or I, you, you can't. You can't be a corporate climber in 2024 and not be a sellout. You just can't. That's do right. Well, you can't be speaking your opinion. You're not allowed to because Fortune 500 companies are woke now. It's just yeah. a fact. <laughs> but I think it's uh, a true thing that, that people are seeking to deny now that in 2024, like, well, I have my I have my podcast, but it's on private, private, private for only my wife and my son. They watch it. So it's like, I mean, why do a podcast if if you say like, hey, I like um, Donald Trump, if you're going to get fired for it, that were people, people live this way now. People that live, work for corporations just have accepted. And I mean, conservatives that are supposed to be pro free speech in the right way, the non pornographic ways. They're like, yeah, you know, it would be nice to just be a freelancer and to be able to um, speak what's on my mind. And I was like, oh, you mean the right of the sovereign right of conscience? <laughs> like, yeah, that would be such a bonus. But instead, I want this thirty thousand dollar a year bonus to keep happening. So I traded in my sovereign right of conscience, which is 
the emanation of the right of speech. So, um, yeah. So it's one thing to be ambitious as a freelancer, which is very, it's, it's eminently possible as I, I think the four of us show, but it doesn't mean that you're rolling in cash and maybe you can, you can be successful that way. Um, I like the, the, the definition that will came to, because again, just consulting book four of the Nick and McKean ethics, sorry, broken record. Yeah. Ambition is the middle way between something called like, um, I don't know if he names the vice of excess, but it's like vicious ambition, too much ambition. It's, it's all money centered. And, um, uh, what is the vice of deficiency Spot. there? Yeah. I think he, I think, yeah, it's like softness or something. Um, it just means you don't, you don't care about anything, but, but properly oriented ambition means, which does incline toward the over ambition. It just means that you're passionate about, you know, lifestyle, um, in a deeper sense, lifestyle accoutrements. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're rich. It just means you're very, very passionate about the kind of life that you and your wife are going to have. And and so women want to avoid men who do not fall in that category. Right. Great. Uh, next one I've got is if a woman does not admire the man she is with in basically every way, dump him. Because I think the alternative to this will lead to what Tim and Steph cover in chapter six about talking bad about your spouse. Um, yeah, I think you know, we just talked about this on the last episode. Men and women aren't equal. And feminism has run so deep into the minds and hearts of women that they, I think a lot of them have lost the capacity to admire a man to look up to him as superior in the meaningful ways. Uh, a woman should find him very interesting. She should be curious about what he thinks about the world, problems, um, politics. That should be the way that she's trying to most access the world. Well, what does he think about this? What does he think is funny? Um, and if that's not the case, you're going to get married and you're going to start talking to your other wife women friends that he lets you have and say, well, he's not very smart and he's kind of lazy. Well, oh, you know him. He, he's not really into that sort of thing or don't, don't even bother asking him like, this is my opinion on things. Um, and I think the main way in which, uh, women should admire their, their man is in virtue and specifically with the faith. If, if this is a Catholic woman, um, it's St. Paul says you shouldn't be unequally yoked. And if you're coming into that relationship with some kind of disparity where, um, and this is not, I hate all the caveats that need to be made. This is not if he doesn't have enough Marian consecrations. This is not what I'm talking about. Please see the show that we did on prayer. But if he's genuinely just does not have a uh, strong faith and a strong moral compass, and that's on you. You don't admire him for that. There's going to be, I think, tremendous resentment there. What do you guys say about that? Yeah. Man's got to lead in all areas. But specifically, yeah, if you're not her intellectual superior, I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a problem. And, and spiritual superior too. That was one of the things that almost broke it for us at the beginning when my wife and I started dating was she was so much further ahead than I was in her, you know, walk with God. And I was just this, just painful degenerate. And then by the grace of God, we got back together and I'm very much the, the leader in all these things. She doesn't want to talk too much about, no, no, she wants to talk about the faith. But when I start getting into church history and all like the, the staunch int intellectual tradition of the church, I kind of like lose her because she's not as interested in that kind of stuff that, that, that I am, but she definitely appreciates the sort of the disparity in the intellect when it comes to that. And the, 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 how much further ahead she feels I am in her faith, even though I think she's obviously devoted and very pious and loves God and, you know, is, is, is becoming, you know, a Catholic and all those things. But I think that plays to our dynamic very well. I think that's sort of how it should be. Poli I think that's, there's an element of polarity there as well that I think guys undermine often. Yeah. Tim, didn't uh, you basically bring the faith to staff? Yeah, I, had i mean she'd been raised by a non by half of her family her dad's side of the family 
was nominally Catholic, but she was never, she'd never been baptized. And she, she had, she was a nothing from her mom's side of the family who, whom she was raised by. Um, so yeah, I, I brought Steph the faith and I, it, I, I would, I would make the caveat. Yeah, yeah, you, you do need to, in ordinary cases, really be the, be the, the one who is the moral leader. So you can be priest, prophet, king. You need to be admired, um, not just spiritually, but morally by her. And you, again, should be the leader in social situations. You should be the sort of front, front facing door of the edifice. And you, you know, she should in my, whatever flair you have in your personality, it should be something she likes. It's weird when you meet one of those couples and the man is always trying to be funny. And maybe he's, he's like kind of good at it at a barbecue and the wife is like rolling her eyes at it. It's like, clearly he thinks this is one of his pieces of flair. And if she's annoyed by it, like why ever would you have been attracted to it? You don't have to be attracted to all the, the different kinds of style that men may dawn, but you ought to be attracted to the one you picked or else you're just stupid. Steph always makes that point. But I would say um, that there, there is, of course, this isn't the perfectionist fallacy. There's, there's room for once, once you really get to know someone there, women are going to know you're not perfect. They see you better than anyone come to know you better than anyone. You're a woman will come to know you better than anyone. And, um, and, um, this is one of the things that besides the, the pure eudaimonia drive that all men have to, to become naturally virtuous and all the virtues, the real kind of boots on the ground impetus to get better is you at least at your major thing or things, which is holding you back is desiring, craving after the admiration of your woman, which is well-ordered. Yep. The only point I was thinking, listening to you guys is that Mary was holier than Joseph right? Completely free of even venial sin. So that was an example of her being more virtuous. But Tim's made the great point before that had she not submitted to Joseph, then she would not, in fact, have been the greatest saint. So there's a curious kind of dynamic there where the woman can, I mean, in the holy family itself, be the holier of the two. And I think that actually happens in a lot of marriages where the woman is more virtuous in very important ways, but you can still be the the spiritual leader in terms of instruction and education like Mike's talking about. So if you're a woman and, just, and you recognize that you're sorry, Tim, I was just going to say, Joseph still offers the turtle doves. <laughs> it, it is the altar offering um, it, yeah. when they, when they present Jesus. So yeah, go on. Yeah, it's, he, she's definitely the holier, and it's definitely an exception. But he's still the spiritual head, even though yeah, she's exactly he's sinless. Yeah. That's just a nuance I wanted to add because I think a lot of women are going to find that um, just like that, they are um, they're purer, like morally, than a lot of the guys at the moment that they might be able to pick from, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that it can't work. Yeah, and and I do think that the right woman can inspire no, virtue in man not. a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So happened to me. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, um, and, and the point I was making was also not an academic one. Yeah. Like most guys, especially guys who do have any interest in the faith, they're probably going to like consume more content about it than the average woman. Um, but that doesn't honestly mean anything. Cause Mike, as you just went through, like when it came to spiritually leading Karen into the Catholic faith, it had nothing to do with any academic questions. You had to be a leader. So that's, again, the point isn't academic, um, but she should look up to you. And I really like Tim's example of uh, if she's rolling her eyes, oof. If the, if the quirk about you, if like your, your laugh, you know, if she's like shushing your laugh, I've been shushed, shushed for my laugh before. Like <laughs> eh, bad, bad, like she should be dumping you right then and there. Like if you can't stand the expression of joy or like the type of humor or whatever it is about the guy. Um, and even if you don't like, like it right out of the gate, but you like him enough to be like, man, I wonder what he sees in this. Like, 
I, I want to look at it with a fresh set of eyes here because I, I love him so much. Just dump him. Like, don't waste his time. Um, Mike or Tim, do you, you guys want to offer up your secondaries? Well, I think what's, I guess this is just an add on to this sort of point is um, if he has like no degree of mastery in any area of his life, then mm -hmm. probably look past him. Competence is incredibly important. Um, ma mastery. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, these, all these things are kind of inextricably linked, but if you're looking at a man should have the respect of other men around him, especially other men that are respectable men in, in and of themselves, that's a strong litmus test of a man too. And so I tell any guy that's like, you can, you want a woman, right? Um, gain the respect of the men around you. And that'll be a lot easier for you to do. And I think a requirement of that is some level of competency, some level of mastery in a certain area. So if he's just kind of like this video game playing, you know, he works a normal office job and there's no real mastery, no real, no, nothing really to him, then eh, I don't know. You should probably dump him. That's similar to the, uh, the point we opened with about being useful and adding value to the social circles that you move in. So great advice from Mike that if you are a single guy looking for a woman, get the respect of men first. She'll take you more seriously. Things will be a lot easier. I was talking to Nick a while back about having watched some of the old Batman cartoons with my son and some of the Batman lines, I think are great for masculinity. Uh, there's one, uh, it's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me, right? Masculinity and action. You can't be like uh, what the red pill guys call a secret king and have this <laughs> idea that oh, yeah, you're, you're really great at this stuff and everyone should treat you really seriously, but you just haven't shown it yet. It's just all top secret. No, you actually have to prove it, show it. Like, what have you mastered? How have you imposed your will on your environment? How have you benefited people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great answer to the ambition negotiation is have you are you truly a man who has mastered at least one craft that, that you can that you can offer the world? And and this is when it comes to men, young men trying to understand women and they're primping and stuff that you don't get it. Women don't care about primping or or even even um muscles as much as we think they should now they do care about height but the main thing they want aside from that is um are you have you mastered something and that means you have sufficiently been ambitious in one area at least and and one's enough men don't have to be holistic or, or comprehensive in their approach to the world w women are more considered more holistic uh, men have to be in in terms of the way that they would mediate their passion. They have to they have to be really good at one thing. That's what really gets women into a guy is um, oh he's really good at a really cool thing. Yeah, yeah, and have the humility that it takes a lifetime to really master one thing. Like if right. he says he's a master at everything, he's he's probably not. A dilettante. Yeah. So if he has no mastery of anything, not even one thing, dump him. And if yeah. the one thing that he is a master of is like yo-yoing, then he's probably Nick in eighth grade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds I, cool. Whoa, 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 whoa. You, you claim in mastery in eighth grade? <laughs> this, that's a big claim. That's a tall claim, my friend. I trained under the best. I, I would have bet on that guy, though, little Nick in eighth grade. I would have said he's going to make it at something. When he, when he applies the energy to something like, I don't know, could be making documentaries, he's going to go far. That it's the yo-yo the yo -yo passion coming through in the documentaries I make. It's, it's the it. same fervor and drive. Yeah, people watch Died Suddenly around the world, and they're like, this was amazing. This guy must have been a master yo-yoist. <laughs> Seems like this was made by a master yo-yoer. My final and favorite, uh, but not has, this really has a lot less weight than all of the others, is more of a pet peeve personally, uh, video games. If what he spends his time doing is leveling up a small set of pixels in a video game for more than... 
like an like like an hour or two every every month. I I can't even begin to comprehend that. Um, I every month. Mm -hmm. And the reason think, the reason I, I allow you... this, the reason I allow a couple hours every month is um, I have I have two two friends, one from high school, one from after high school, and about every three to four weeks we get on a, a group phone call and play call of duty together. And we catch up about our, our families and our, our struggles and stuff. And it's, it ends up being sort of like a group therapy session or like a, a round of golf. A friend of mine described um, getting online with video games is like the new golf. And so if you're going out all the time and playing golf, like you got a problem and I see guys who, but it's worse. Like, cause golf's like a sport vaguely sort of, um, but video games really, like I was just talking to somebody and they said, um, they were telling me about how tight they were financially. This is really dire straits financially. And within three minutes was describing to me something about how they were playing a particular video game the night before and like how they were winning this certain area of the video game. This is an adult with a child and a wife who is in financial straits and was describing their success in a video game. So I, I think anything more than like an infrequent pastime to me, again, this doesn't have the same kind of weight as like chastity or mama's boy, but for me, dump him. He's playing video games, dump him. Can we all have Wait. a pet peeve ones? Please. Fat Please. guys. <laughs> Fat guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thousand percent. <laughs> Thousand percent. I haven't done my second. I thought, I thought we were each doing two. You guys are all like, like okay, let's bring two to the table. Just and slide these other ones in there. Will comes with four. Nick just fit in the third. I just want to. I, I want to get my second in. But um, so we should do a list of eight and like put up what the eight are. Everyone's like, you know what else I hate? Guys that eat gummy worms. They're freaks. I'm like, Wait, I gotta get my eight, bro. And I, I, I couldn't disagree more on, on that one. Like if a guy plays a video game for an hour a day and that's how he relaxes, then we're, we're, we're blaming the medium, not the, not the, um, I mean, I play video games sometimes, some weeks we'll play two hours a day with the fam and then everyone goes, well, yeah, yeah, but that's different. That's not what young guys do. So it's not the video game that's evil. I mean, if this is how you're relaxing and unwinding, um, for at the end of the day, instead of like an hour and a half, two hour movie, video games are in a lot of ways more engaging of your but brain. You do it with your family. You do it with your family. Sure. But so it's not that's the video game that's the the problem. We're, we're, we're confusing substance and accident, I think, here. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being very specific about like, Scott. I'm just being very specific about the guy who puts his headphones on, doesn't talk to his, his wife or his children, and builds a character like levels up a character in a game instead of spending time with his family. Now I was just thinking about uh, trying to find like a two player video game for Isabel and I to play because I think that right. we watch movies and I'm like, I'd be a lot more fun if we were like solving things to get, Oh no, go over here. Right. Oh, that's right. scary. That I think that's awesome. I'm, I'm specifically referring to the guys who lock in and put hours into world of Warcraft. Yeah, it's like your yeah. wife's sad. I, I don't care. My warlock's okay. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking no, about? Tim, Tim my of course, warlock's like wife, Helena, in my second life is pleased with me because I have my oh. HP has never been higher. You're like, no, I mean your real wife, idiot. Your no, real wife is currently filing is... for divorce. I mean, I would say the same thing if the guy was, I don't know. There's no good analogy to like single player video games where you're like, You know what I mean, damn it. As, uh, we, no, we, yeah, know, I just people people I love video, I used to love video games. I I played that stuff for years. I just I think the only place it's appropriate is how Tim is doing it with his family. I can't imagine how like how effeminate and gay I would feel if I just put on my headphones. It's like, okay, Karen, I'm a Dan Serafina. I'm gonna daddy's gonna go play some video games now. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like beep, beep, beep. And he got these like headphones on, like, bro. Gosh, Karen, I'm in the middle of a game. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that one, Nick. But guys I do it like eight hours a day, like it's a job. 
and it's a young guy thing. It's even um, I'm watching this. I've been watching these Netflix um, do series docs on there was one on like quarterback and they did receiver for the NFL. And now they did starting five for the NBA and like all of the young NBA guys. Um, uh, it's just some weird coincidence. All of the black guys are raising kids all alone. There's like not a mother in the, in the the home. That's, that's just some, must be some coincidence. Um, but they all like come home and just play video games. Like they're obsessed with video games. I'm like, did you have to go practice your jump shot? Like what's going on with that? It, it's, it's a lot. So I, I get the sense in which people, especially trad say this. So oh, video games is like, okay, well it's, it's the, the time alone and the indulgence and the um, solipsism and the escapism and all that um, and not wanting to engage. But sometimes like, instead of watching a movie, we, we go into phases and I, I know everyone here has made the allowance on the list or whatever, but um, sometimes it's way more engaging. Like you're saying, Nick, to, it's like, I'm kind of, once we run out of good movies to watch and I'm very picky with movies, then it's just like, okay, let's for two hours before we go to sleep, let's all play a video game. And you notice it, it conduces to more interactivity and less just oh, people kind of falling asleep on their own. But don't, don't competitiveness. Don't, yeah, for sure. Um, don't make the mistake though of thinking that as long as it's not video games, it's okay. Here's a right. message from a, a wife who was asking for help. And she just said, look, husband's just after work, checking out and he's not there. Most of his free time is spent with fantasy football, video games, phone calls with his friends, the gym. I don't, I know he doesn't mean it, but I feel put last. So it's really about having some kind of hobby, whatever it might be, that mm. is not place properly in the hierarchy of overall duties and priorities in your life. You could be doing something like, I don't know, um, BJJ or going to the gym too much and wrecking your marriage because of that. That's the underlying principle Nick's talking about. Yeah. yeah. She's supposed to be your best friend. Like if you, that's why I was thrilled by the idea of like, what, Oh, what if I could like play a fun video game with her that like we're both have never played before. Cause then it's like, you're playing a movie. Like you get to like, control the movie that sounded fun but tim i don't want to skip over your second one tim what was your what was your well you did <laughs> no i'm just, <laughs> just um, it's just like everyone get two and then everyone's like here's my five um, um so my my for so number eight the official number eight on the list is um a, a guy that is insufficiently protective or even um what's the other the the other p word he's insufficiently protective or um, Function? Function? wanting you all for his own but yeah well, well yeah possessive. like possessive Pos i mean that like you don't want a guy that's if we're doing the geometric mean here that's just like yeah whatever no worries you know she wanted to go um fly to australia this weekend with her friends it's like dude she's going to get like kidnapped and trafficked on the human sex market, or that's at least how men should be thinking. It's not natural for women to be traveling across the world um, by themselves. So, mm. uh, and, and I mean, even, even I, I think guys out in the suburbs are insufficiently protective. They're just, even the wives that stay home are just schlepping all over town. And it's like, do you, do you know where your wife's at during the day? That, that is, that is just scary because the world's a scary place. Um, on the other hand, you know, and, and, and there is a, a real overlap between possessivity and protectivity. And on the other hand, you don't want to be the the 15 or 16 year old, you know, with their, your first girlfriend that's like over possessive with everything or, you know, cause then you just look like hurt. Um, and I, you know, I, I was like this with my first little girlfriend. And then once I started dating around, dating well, um, many girls in, in, in late high school and college, I was like, I did a thing where I was like, Oh, I'm never, ever going to show possessivity or protectivity. Um, and of course it wasn't natural cause it was just sort of dating on the market, but that that's an overreaction because, um, women are very attracted to being protected and you being like, yeah, look, you're my one and only, even before you're married, if you are a boyfriend and girlfriend, you should be possessive and protective and wanting to drive her everywhere. And, and, um, so there, there's a, a geometric mean that probably slightly inclines towards the, the too possessive and protective for, at least for married people. It, that's well-ordered. Mm. Yeah. 
And if a guy's not this, then then dump him. There's something very effeminate about him not wanting to be your bodyguard. The, uh, the secular unsafe. Evo psych people say that pair bonding originated in mate guarding, like the bodyguard hypothesis. That's where they think it started. So that's their take on it, Tim. It's the same thing. Like the main yeah. purpose of the man is to protect and be possessive. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really disordered not to be. And, yeah. And yep. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. A lot of mono. mono no, I was board. just going to say. Yeah. Most are. guys nowadays aren't. I think, I think they want to be. A lot of them aren't, but they want to be because they've been so bombarded by feminist programming and being like a controlling possessive guy uh it's a good trait it's just been beat out of most men like i've as young as i can remember i've kind of always been like that protective yeah. you know whatever a little possessive and that there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's not needy and clingy that's another one you could maybe add on the list too is like don't be a needy clingy guy if he if he's needy and clingy like he's un he's actually a liability to you he's not going to protect you but i think most guys have it in them they had they react that way they just don't know how to actualize it because it's been you don't be controlling no actually uh yeah you should be because well, right. first of all don't date a girl that wants to go on a girl trip to miami because if she does <laughs> she's not the one and if you let her you're an idiot and you're cuckold that's what you right. are as a cuckold mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great point hey i was thinking maybe we could finish with like a quick fire one where we just give other things with no explanation i think it'd be hilarious <laughs> just keep going around the group no explanation at all so like okay, I, yeah. I said I fat like guys that. Okay, fat guys. How fast can we go? Fat guys. Guys for debaters. Oakley's. Oakley's sunglasses. Guys that wear their guys that wear um their feet exposed in sandals outside. Hey. <laughs> uh, I guys that, that wear shorts outside on the side of their car. Psych psychedelics. Ooh. Um watches the Andrew Huberman podcast. Guys that wear their watch on the inside of their wrist. I hate that. <laughs> Car payment is more than 10% of his gross monthly income. Okay, Dave Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> I 100% agree with that. That's such a good point. Mm. Um, does yoga. Eats a low-protein diet. Has a mullet. Doesn't drink water. This is personal. <laughs> that one was personal. <laughs> that is personal. We had to build me and Nick. Me and Nick are like, wait, what? I'm dudes I'm getting... who wear flannels. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Guys that don't train their legs. Dump them. Serious one. Just... People who are stupid, like just can't learn from their mistakes, do the same dumb stuff over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Man buns. Like, I, I oh, like yeah. guys. just no man buns. Tribal tats. Mm. Honestly, tats in general. That's coming from a guy who covered in them. Most tats, I'll say. Can't admit that he's wrong. Yeah, drinks Ever. IPA beers. Ooh, see that's that's personal too. Not to me though. <laughs> Tim, don't you IPA? like IPAs? What'd you say, Mike? IPA drinks beers. IPA beers. Oh wow, shots fire! I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't really <laughs> drink beer anymore, but I liked, I liked IPAs once. Shots fire! No, it didn't strike me as an IPA guy. Come on. Well, I mean, yeah. Are you drinking them like? In Oregon, with like a dude, 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 mustache dude, dude. and with They're like bitch a, tits in a glass. Yeah, that's what IPAs are to me. <laughs> They're man boobies in a, in a glass. <laughs> they became. They started out that way in places like Portland, San Diego, but but yeah, true. I'm from really Vancouver. The breweries are everywhere there. That's why I say this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it was like handlebar mustache, Brooklyn, Portland. Like those guys just need to get punched in the face. Handlebar mustache. Yeah. Let's just go that. I think if any, it took me four minutes to come up with one. Any guy who, when you make uh, a fully affirmative claim, they have to provide a, like some instance where that's not applicable. Yeah, exception. Those oh, those people don't have inner dialogues. People that don't, men that don't have inner dialogues. 
Um, that was a pretty good quick fire round. I'm, I'm no. impressed. We added like 20 things on to the to the good that list was. already. So yeah. if, if you're a woman who's made it all the way through, like that's narrowed it down. Yeah. Yeah. Congrats. You now have no options. <laughs> <laughs> there are six you're men welcome. on the planet that met all these requirements. <laughs> what if what if a woman date like texted her boyfriend? We're done because Mike said IPAs and then heard Tim say, I drink IPAs and then texted back. It was like, never mind. Never mind. Wait, did you drink them in Portland or San Diego or Brooklyn? Okay. <laughs> and does fine. he have bitch tips? <laughs> That's also an important question. Just to be clear, the, the quick fire round is not official church teaching. <laughs> yeah. It's not official CMAS teaching. It's it's not, it's not, a no. lot of discord in the CMAS <laughs> on this. Remember, the, the greatest item from Steph's dumper, original dumper list that got so many men in trouble with their jobs was um, has too many plants. <laughs> That was from like where we were just finishing up the list. And she's like, yeah, girls shouldn't have too many plans. Uh, that's, that's good. That if was the he, quick fire. He knows his, I mean, we did, we had this, we had this in uh, the dump her list. If he knows his star sign, dump him. His, <laughs> you know, his what? His star, his star sign. sign. His astrological sign. Or, or like maybe he knows it, but if he knows like about it, like if he knows the subcategories of personality traits as a result, because I'm a Virgo, so. Yeah, I, I, I think I know mine. I just, I know what month I was born in, but isn't it a month thing? Because there's 12, I, I know from astronomy, there's 12 zodiacs, so. I'm an Aquarius. That's what I am, guys. Aquarius. I'm a strategist. It's the dawning of the age. All right, well. Does anyone have any others? No, this has gone off the deep end. I think it. we're done here, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good show, guys. I will Great see you show. next week. God bless. Take care. God bless God you, bless. dudes. Peace. Peace.